Well, thank you everyone for joining us uh, for this timely webinar about the rising tide of anti-Asian American sentiment and COVID and the COVID-19 crisis. My name is Abraham Kim. I'm the executive director of the Council of Korean Americans here in Washington, DC. Uh, my organization is a national network of Korean American executives and professionals uh, from across the country focused on developing Asian American leaders and strengthening the voice of the Korean American community. I have the honor today to serve uh, as a moderator of what we hope will be an informative and active conversation with three top civic leaders in the Asian American and Pacific Islanders communities. My guests are Madeline Milka, President and CEO of the Asian Pacific Institute of Congressional Studies. Second is Greg Orton, National Director at the National Council of Asian Pacific Americans. And finally, John Yang, President and Executive Director of the Asian Americans Advancing Justice. Welcome to all three of you. In a moment, I'll ask my guests to introduce themselves briefly uh, about their organizations for those of you not familiar with their tremendous work. Uh, from my understanding, we have over 300 people from across the country signed up today. I'd love to know where all of you are hailing from. So down at the bottom of your, of your screen is a little chat uh, icon. If you can click that and tell me, uh, enter in the city that you're calling from, uh, we'd love to know where you're where you're coming from. Oh, it's going crazy <laughs> here. DC, Las Vegas, Tennessee, Milwaukee, uh, and many, many more. Well, thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, before we kick it off today, uh, I want to highlight our goals for today's conversation. Number one is to better inform our community. And number two, we want to stimulate more conversations across the country and generate new ideas uh, to work together uh, as a community to protect our citizens uh, and our neighborhoods. And then finally, three, uh, we hope to inspire communities to mobilize for action. We cannot be passive and simply reactive during these times. I think you'll all agree that we are in uncharted territory. And then finally, um, we want to get all of you involved by taking your questions at the end of our conversation today. Uh, I apologize in advance that we will not be like, we will not likely be able to get through all the questions, but at the bottom of your screen, uh, you'll see a little Q&A icon. If you click there, uh, my, you can enter your questions and my staff will monitor and send me questions uh, at the end of our panel conversation today. So with that, uh, let's get started. Um, Let's start with uh, with you, Madeline. Uh, can you share briefly uh, about your um, about your organization and and then as an as an AAPI leader, can you give us your assessment of what you are seeing in regards to the rise of Asian American sentiment uh, while our country is going through this public health crisis, Madeline? Sure, thank you very much for this opportunity, Abe, for uh, organizing this. Um, I am uh, the president and CEO of the Asian Pacific American Institute for Congressional Studies, otherwise known as APAX. Uh, we are a 26-year-old organization originally founded by um, former Secretary Norm Mineta when he was a member of Congress. Um, and at the same time, he also co-founded um, the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, of which we are basically uh, associated and aligned with um, the caucus. And so um, in that, our mission is to increase AAPI representation at all levels of government from community service to elected office. Uh, and so seeing this is um, heartbreaking in so many ways because um, obviously being founded by uh, Norman Netta where he himself was interned as a young child um, and coming back um, to his hometown of San Jose um, and seeing um, the racism and xenophobia that was uh, enacted upon the Japanese American community, um, and later on as an adult, seeing him as um, a member of um, a White House administration where he was transportation secretary and was able to recall his experiences um, to President Bush and have that not be replicated to the Muslim American community is something that um, you know, continuously uh, reminds the APEX team about how it's so important for us to have representation and how it's so important for us to um, value all of our constituencies and 
it is something that Secretary Benet has always encouraged in the sense of what he sees as the fabric of America, that we all have our own identities and that we're not homogeneous and that each of those identities make up America, um, and that we don't lose our identities for it. Um, and so seeing this um, in itself is something that we need our leaders um, and those not from our community to remind others that we are not other and that we are part of this um, fabric of America. Great, thank you. Greg? Uh, hi, everybody, and thanks, Abe and CKA, for having me. My name is Greg Orton. I'm the National Director of the National Council of Asian Pacific Americans, and we are the big umbrella coalition of 35 national AAPI civil rights organizations, and we were founded over 20 years ago, and the idea was there are a number of AAPI organizations out there doing great work, and we all know that when we come together, we're stronger for it, and so We've been actively organizing all of our members to talk about the various issues that impact us. And certainly today we find ourselves in sort of, not new circumstances, but certainly unique ones in terms of combating anti-Asian rhetoric. And so, you know, we all know that COVID-19 has been in the news for quite some time. And as far as many of our organizations, we've been talking about it since, you know, months ago when Lunar New Year celebrations were being canceled uh, all over the country. And at the time, um, it was done out of caution, certainly understandable, but I don't know if any of us could have necessarily anticipated um, the circumstances growing to be this dire. And so, you know, I'll certainly let John talk about more of some of the specific examples his organization has seen, but broadly speaking, um, our coalition has seen an up, a significant uptick in sort of anti-Asian rhetoric, uh, hate crimes, in incidents, and then on Twitter, certainly there's uh, a great degree of frequency in terms of just people sharing their anecdotal uh, stories and evidence of harassment and intimidation. So thank you all for having me. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Great. John? John, we can't hear you. Sorry. My name is John Yang. I'm the President and Executive Director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC. So we are part of an affiliation of five independent affiliates in Chicago, Atlanta, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. Uh, that works to promote a fair and equitable society for all and focuses on advancing the civil and human rights for Asian Americans. I was looking at the number of people uh, coming in and participating on this webinar. I want to give a special shout out. I saw someone from Edinburgh, Scotland uh, that is tuning in. <laughs> so uh, special shout out to them. Thank you all for participating and thank you Abe, for putting this together. It, we are at an important time here. Uh, as Greg said, cer certainly since late January or even mid-January, all of us started expressing concern about potential anti-Asian hate and started seeing some incidents of anti-Asian hate. And we started speaking out about that at that time and making sure that the terms that people were using uh, were proper terms, terms that the medical experts, the health experts recognize are the proper terms. That would be COVID-19, a novel coronavirus, and to avoid terms that stigmatize communities terms such as Kung Flu or the Chinese virus. Uh, unfortunately, since mid-early, mid-January, we've seen an increase by leaps and bounds of hate incidents and literally, literally physical violence against Asian Americans. And so I think all of us here are really committed to speaking out about that, making sure that the media understands the gravity of the situation and how terms really matter. I know a number of us will talk a little bit about what we're doing to track this and address this, but certainly one of the, the, the takeaways that I would have, especially for all the audience members here, is that you know we hear what's going on in the community and where we really want to be part of the solution and think actively about how to address all of these different pieces. Certainly also, by way of preface to the audience, I want to say to everyone, please stay safe, stay healthy, we appreciate that you're tuning in uh, and leaning into this moment. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I, I wanted to um, take one part of your comment uh, mo uh, just momentarily. Um, you said that uh, we see a lot of anecdotes and stories about uh, you know aggression and, and some of the over violence that are taking place across uh, country. Is there any systematic data being collected on these cases? Um, why? If they are, where can we find this? If not, why not? And what are what are the efforts that are being done to collect more systematic information? 
Yeah, thank you. I, it, there's a number of different efforts going on. So our organization, our affiliation, uh, Asian Americans Advancing Justice, we have a website where people can report their hate incidents, hate crimes. That's standagainsthatred.org. Uh, OCA, uh, organization formerly known as the Organization of Chinese Americans, also has a website. I think it's AAP, aapihatecrimes.org. I also saw that there is another website that was developed in California by Chinese for Affirmative Action and A3PCon, if I remember that acronym correctly, that is also tracking hate crimes and hate incidents. All, all three of us are starting to work together to collect that data so that we have a comprehensive picture. By our various accounts, certainly, and this is just anecdotal, this is not a systematic way of tracking it, right? Because obviously, a lot of these hate crimes, hate incidents go unreported uh, and they don't make it to all of our web websites or are not reported to law enforcement. But even that systemat that anecdotal research that all of, have, all of us have done suggests that easily within the last three weeks there have been over 400 incidents of physical violence or verbal assault. 400 incidents in the last 21 days. So this is a significant thing that we're dealing with. And, and let me be clear, we're not just talking about racial epithets and racial slurs, which obviously for our community is bad enough. We're talking about physical violence. We're talking about people getting kicked, people getting punched, uh, people getting physically assaulted, only for the fact that they are Asian American and there is this misperception, misinformation that is out there about what coronavirus, what COVID-19 really is. How about you, Greg? Are you aware of uh, other uh, other uh, efforts to collect data on on uh, on this on aggression and harassments across country. Sure. So I'll, I'll agree with everything John said, and certainly for everyone who's participating, I want to give a lot of credit to him and his organization for stand, standing up that website. It's actually been around for a number of years, and so it's it was really helpful to have that in place when all this sort of came together as far as the COVID nineteen sort of response and to every, everything taking off. Um, as far as other collection efforts, I know there are other Asian American leaders who are currently trying to engage the FBI and potentially DOJ on this issue. Um, OCA recently sent a letter to the White House, uh, DOJ and the FBI, uh, engaging them about potentially creating a task force and their own information practices when it comes to these incidents. And so, as John said, we're all in constant communication about this and the hope is that um, that front of, uh, of engagement can lead to some positive conversations, but it's sort of to be determined sort of where that goes since it's very early on. Is this information publicly available? I think there's some folks in the chat room asking, is this information available to the public or is this something right now just being collected by these organizations? So I'll defer to John as far as the information their website's collecting. I know there's been a number of news stories that have begun to crop up about other, you know, some of these tracking efforts. And so I, I don't know, John, I'll, I'll kick it back to you on that one. Right, and so the two California groups put out what I would regard, and hopefully they wouldn't take it the wrong way, a, a preliminary study of some of the hate crimes and hate incidents that have taken place. And I think there's been some news reporting about that uh, that, have t that has taken place literally in the last two days. The only reason I would call it preliminary is, as we all know, this is still happening right now. So what they've tried to do is you know, capture as much information as they can uh, over this last three to four week period so that they ha we have at least a snapshot. Again, it's not a comprehensive study. None of us have a comprehensive study, but it, it gives a pretty good snapshot of what we are seeing throughout the country. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to um, sh shift the conversation a little bit about some of the headlines that are going on lately. Um, as, as, as all of you know, um, one of the troubling issues that many Asian American leaders have identified is how uh, President Trump and even Secretary of State Mike Pompeo have been using the term um, China virus to describe COVID-19. Uh, despite uh, members of his own administration and the WHO have repeatedly said this is not only inaccurate, uh, but also an inappropriate reference to this uh, disease. Um, President Trump reason is because uh, he has given because the, obviously the, the pandemic, according to his word, had started in China. And plus he has argued that um, he's also countering um, China's own information campaign to start rumors that COVID-19 originated from the United States and, and 
in the U.S. military was somehow involved uh, with this with this virus. Um, the president suggested that he's using this for foreign policy reasons, ultimately. And then he discounted any thought that his words are stoking anti-Chinese American sentiment uh, within the United States. Uh, and then recently on Monday, he tweeted, um, uh, he tweeted uh, supporting the Chinese American community. It says, it is very important, quote, it is very important that we totally protect our Asian American community in the United States and all around the world. They are amazing people and the spreading of the virus is not their fault in any way, shape or form. They are working closely with us to get rid of it. We will prevail together. And then uh, he goes on uh, to say other things. Um, Madeline, um, what are your thoughts about, uh, about this recent tweet? And um, it, is this effective in, uh, in your view in st hopefully stemming some of the tide of this anti-Asian American sentiment that we've seen? I appreciate President Trump um, addressing this issue. I hope that um, other elected leaders will also follow in, in uh, using the correct language um, suggested by um, WHO. Um, we have seen other leaders in other states throughout the country um, use the Chinese virus or imply other um, uh, you know, false uh, comparisons um, or outdated comparisons to why it should be called the Chinese virus. And I think this is um, hopefully a start for uh, people to notice this leadership and, and that we continue to see this in a more consistent basis from the president and from our other elected leaders, uh, because we do see that there is a large portion of, of uh, leaders from other cities and other states taking a stand and advocating that this is not something that we should be using in terms of, of um, calling the virus the Chinese virus, and also um, showing their support of the API community. Um, so I hope that this continues in a way that um, can tamp down uh, these instances. Others, Greg, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly worth acknowledging the president's tweet. I would say it's a long overdue correction. Um, certainly, having gone through and sort of witnessed the consistent sort of default to that kind of language over the last few weeks has been pretty frustrating for, for many of us. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm glad that he, he adjusted that language. I mean, I think time will tell whether or not that stays consistent. And truly, you know, I know we've kind of come into a time where tweets carry a lot more weight, but what I'd like to see is sort of that practice or that sort of commitment to not using that language and defending the Asian American community sort of start to trickle down throughout the administration. And, and like Madeline said, other elected officials really getting behind this because, you know, at the end of the day, we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. John? I, I would make a couple of comments. I mean, one is with respect to these naming conventions, right? Because we've certainly seen some people say, well, we used to always name these viruses by geographic location. Well, that's true. But the World Health Organization and CDC have recognized that that causes a stigma to be attached to those locations, those ethnicities, those races. That's precisely why we don't name viruses after geographic locations now. And we should follow our health experts, our medical experts, uh, even Trump, the Trump administration's own HHS secretary, Sec Secretary Alex Azar, recognizes the stigma and doesn't use that name. So that's one piece that I would urge everyone to be cognizant of. Just because a name was used in the past doesn't make it right now. We all know that language evolved. The second piece that, that President Trump has talked about, I think, deserves a little bit of discussion as well, is this notion of that China is at fault or, or something along those lines. Look, if he has disagreements with the Chinese government uh, as a foreign policy matter, that is certainly within a president's discretion to make. But that is very different than talking about it in a way that endangers Chinese people, Chinese Americans, Asian Americans as a whole. And this issue was brought up to him at a White House press briefing, how it is endangering Asian Americans as a whole in the manner in which he was talking about it. And at that initial time, he effectively doubled down on what he was saying. I agree with Greg. It's better late than never that he has acknowledged that there is harm being faced by our community and that he is backtracking by saying that we should need to protect Asian Americans. 
but we need to recognize the harm that has already been caused. I'm, I'm, uh, there's the flip side of this issue uh, regarding, uh, regarding the Chinese government as well. Uh, they've gone on a, um, I've seen some articles where uh, the Chinese government is now trying to change the rhetoric as, as well. And so it's, it's becoming, this rhetoric is becoming a more geopolitical struggle between these two governments. Do you think it's fair to uh, criticize the Chinese government? Or wh what's your sense on um, how we should approach what's coming in from the information that's coming in from China? John? At least from my perspective, I, I think all governments need to focus on the medical and health risks mm -hmm. and figure out how best to address the medical and health risks. Yeah. This is, it's silly right now to be getting into this blame game uh, as to who caused what. I, certainly, if people want to have that debate at a later time, you know, that's outside of my realm of expertise uh, with respect to my organization and my own personal experience. What I'm concerned about right now is our Asian American community here. And all of this rhetoric does not help the physical, mental uh, well-being of our community here. And that's why I, I think we need to be very, very careful about the words that we use. Those words matter to our community. Um, I wanted to, um, we all mentioned that, um, uh, that we are encouraged that there are actually leaders that are speaking out uh, against uh, the anti rise of anti Asian American um, sentiment. I think most recently, California Governor Newsom had tweeted and also uh, made it a part of his speech, as well as uh, Illinois Governor Pritzker had mentioned, um, had um, important comments related relating to not tying ethnicity and race to this pandemic. And obviously our friend, uh, chairwoman of KPAC, Julie, uh, Judy Chu, Congresswoman Judy Chu has, and her colleagues have repeatedly spoken out. Um, but there are a lot of folks at the state level. Um, in fact, I just got an email from um, State Assemblyman Raj uh, Mukherjee. I hope I got your name right. Uh, he's the Deputy Speaker Pro Temp uh, from the New Jersey Legislature. Uh, and he asks uh, to all of you, um, what can be done by policymakers and state legislators besides bias intimidation statutes and enacting immigration friendly laws to battle xenophobia more generally during this COVID-19 environment? Um, how do we make sure that the welfare and safety of our diverse communities, including the Asian American community, are not lost in the shuffle of all the important issues dealing with public health and economic recovery in the pandemic. So if you're speaking to our state level and our local level officials, what, what would you recommend uh, as civic leaders to that? John? <laughs> I, I, yeah, I was trying to yield the floor to, to Greg and Madeline. I think with respect to state level leaders, thank you for speaking out. Thank you for speaking correctly. That is an excellent first step. What I would suggest also is as we're, and I think we'll probably talk a little bit about potential stimulus packages from coming from Congress, thinking about what resources you can make available to make sure that those stimulus packages, that information trickles down to our Asian American community, whether it's healthcare benefits, whether it's small business benefits. Because we all know that legislation is hard to, for anyone to understand especially people with limited English proficiency. So making resources available so that those materials are translated, understandable for, for people in our community. I think those are excellent steps. On the hate crimes area, uh, and I saw this in one of the questions, is offer some sort of bystander training uh, and sort of talk about what you can do as a citizen if you see an anti-hate incident. You know, little things like standing next to the victim Little things about making sure that the victim feels safe, you know, helping that, that victim walk to a safe place. Those small incidents, obviously you should focus on your own personal security too before you do it. But those small gestures go a long way to making us all feel more unified. And that's the unfortunate thing about these hate crimes, right? Is that it makes us all feel more isolated. It makes us all more fearful. So thinking about those small things that people can do bring us all back together, bring us all to feel more safe. Those are great things that all of us can continue to talk about, continue to, to outreach on. Thank you. Great. 
Kathleen or Greg? Yes, thank you very much and uh, appreciate the question um, and all the work that you do in public service. The, the one suggestion that I would have is, is for us to all remember about coalition is that it's our responsibility too to be good allies to other communities of color and other minorities and other marginalized communities. And in that, um, being able to build coalition with others who, who may experience th this in a different time, um, in a different situation, is equally important for us um, in building that type of community organizing. Um, and so, uh, as John said, being able to you know, have bystander training and being able to be an ally um, and stand up and speak up for others, um, as well as um, when you're speaking up for the AAPI community. So, um, I would highly recommend that in terms of making sure that we are equal partners in, um, in assuring that um, people feel safe. Yeah, if I can jump in real quick, one thing I'll add, and thank you again to all the state and local electeds who are on and all the work they're doing. Uh, we, we've been through this before. When Congress and the federal government pass stimulus packages or recovery acts or you know, the BP oil spill, there's billions of dollars that get pushed out to states. And then ultimately, a lot of that money goes to state-based agencies for distribution on, on the ground. Um, despite the seeming you know, unlimited resources of Congress, we have to fight so hard to get language access provisions included in these bills and to make sure that the, our communities actually have a, even a shot at access, accessing some of these resources. And so I would say one thing that um, state and local electeds can do is once that process moves to sort of the state-based distribution, um, you know, even though it should be on Congress to provide resources for translations, like John said, it does fall ultimately on us as a community to make sure that our community members are aware. Um, and as many of us know, we're doing this out of the goodness of our heart and on shoestring budgets, but it doesn't change the fact that my expectation is, despite all the money that will likely come out in stimulus packages, uh, we will ultimately have to fight pretty hard to make sure our communities are aware of what's going on. Uh, that brings up a, a good point that you know this this public health crisis is causing tremendous economic disruption and many people are including our small businesses mom and pop shops are all facing um, economic hardships and, and layoffs and unemployment uh, although we have not seen the final economic recovery support package that is working its way through congress as we speak uh, what can we do um, as community leaders as state leaders uh, to help uh, support the AAPI community in the aftermath of the COVID-19 and all the dis disruptions that it's caused. Um, Greg? Sure, I'll say one I want to, before I go too, too much further, recognize that there are leaders in Congress currently who are fighting for the community, like, like you mentioned, mentioned uh, Chairwoman Judy Chu and Speaker Pelosi. Um, but as far as the work that we can do, I think we've seen the government at times when they do actually try to translate materials, it can be done poorly or inaccurately. And so it does again fall on us to make sure that the right information gets out to the community. And so not knowing ultimately what Congress is going to pass, I will say the House bill that the House of Representatives introduced does have a number of provisions included in it that uh, specifically speak towards uh, language access and inclusivity, as well as actually disaggregated data collection, which is pretty useful. Um, however, it's unclear whether or not that language will be preserved in the, in the package that ultimately passes. Um, passes Congress. Uh, my belief is that the, the Senate bill um, is likely the one that's going to move. However, they're finalizing or are near close to finishing up those negotiations, so we'll have to see. Natalie? I know that this um, economic time is, is stressful for a lot of people, and I think this is also in relationship to our community's mental health and how uh, this is an added strain being that they are small business owners and um, recognizing that there's a lot of uncertainty ahead. So with all that being said, the issue also of um, people's safety on top of that is um, something that isn't necessarily going to be addressed per se in an economic stimulus package. So when we think about the whole being as a person and as a community, there's going to be a lot of repercussions that are going to continue down the line after this has been settled. And um, you know, when you think about also that there has been an uptick in gun purchases because our community also feels 
um, a lack of safety. Um, you know, some of the people who've been interviewed um, when they purchased uh, their uh, guns have mentioned that they felt that they wanted to protect their children or their you know, specific sons or daughters and their families because they felt that uncertainty. So there's a lot of other things outside an economic stimulus package that um, we need to also address in, in making sure that our community feels safe um, as well as understanding the economic security that goes along with it. Mm -hmm. John, any comments? Yeah. I, I think we could go on. I, mean, I think Greg and Madeline covered it very, very well. I have, a, um, as many, of, as you know, uh, many of our audience members here are not only leaders and you know, of organizations and, and uh, public servants in, um, in local and, and state level uh, leaders, but there are a lot of individuals too, a lot of individual citizens. What would you recommend for individual citizens of how to, I guess, respond and support and um, through this period of difficulty, not only with the rise of Asian American, anti, you know, anti Asian American sentiment, but also in really helping our community as individuals? What can we do as citizens? John? Number one is maybe just show your humanity. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is, especially as I see the rise in anti-Asian violence and think about what all of us as individuals can do, part of it is, let's face it, we are being othered. We are being seen as perpetual foreigners, and there are these awful stereotypes that exist for us. If there's anything small that we can do to help break down those stereotypes, I think that helps. Now, I will admit, I feel conflicted about that. And, and I'm speaking very honestly about this is, on one level, it shouldn't be our burden to prove that, that we are not the other. Uh, on, on the other hand, in this unprecedented time, you know, I, I do think that if we all engage in small acts of kindness, it can go a long way to making people feel more unified uh, in, in this moment. Obviously, there are, there are larger things that we can do, uh, especially for the Asian American community. You know, for those re those restaurants, uh, dry cleaners, some of them are still open, from my understanding, based on local ordinances and the like. You know, those 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 stores that we know are Asian American owned, we need to support them now because they are going to be struggling, right? Uh, checking in on you know our neighbors that we know have limited English proficiency. And, and finding a way to connect with them and making sure they have the proper information to the best that we know, right, about what's going on. All of these quote unquote small things do add up to something big. Obviously we at the more national or regional level, we need to figure out more about all of that, how to coordinate on all of that, but uh, we can't let the, the, the perfect be the enemy of the good. Uh, and let's keep doing all of these small things as well. Great. If anything, one of the things that we do talk about at APEX is being an engaged citizen. And so I encourage that uh, even more so in this time because people outside of our community will, will tend to invisibilize us. We are not invisible. And the more uh, we can show up in ways that, again, with social distancing, all the things that and in adhering to public health risk, um, being vocal to our elected leaders, being vocal to our community leaders in ways that shows that we are active citizens, um, because that is so important in making sure that people see us and mm -hmm. understand that we are very much a part of, um, again, the American fabric. Yeah, so I, you know, before I came to Encapa, I spent a good number of years working on Capitol Hill. Uh, for Congressman Al Green down in Houston, Texas. And, you know, being on the inside, I know how powerful letters from constituents can be in moving individual members. And I imagine it's the same for any elected official. So I would encourage everyone, you know, participating in this to really think about, can, can we organize on a community level of engaging with your local representatives? Um, again, a letter with 15, 20 people on it coming from the community actually does carry weight. We would look at those very closely and actually report back to the member sort of what we're hearing. And so I would say, even though at times, you know, the American system of government can feel like it's pretty difficult to penetrate and have your voice heard. And certainly uh, as a broader community, the API community has struggled with this. Um, I would encourage everyone to really take that to heart because in many ways, 
local electeds are paying even more close attention to what's happening in their communities because it because COVID-19 is impacting all of us. And so I think it's an opportunity for the community to really step up and engage in a way that we don't always do. I'm, I'm uh, um, turning to the questions that are coming in from the audience. We have a, we have a, a full slate of questions from all of our listeners here. Uh, I wanted to, um, Valerie Shen asks, um, what can we ask, uh, going off of what Greg had mentioned about engaging with our, our, our congressional representatives, what can we ask our members of Congress and government officials beyond avoiding and condemning anti-Asian rhetoric? Are there other things besides uh, this issue that we should be asking them as a community during this time? I would say ask them to advocate for language access provisions in any sort of legislation that's coming out. Um, again, on a local level, uh, local and elected officials have an opportunity to weigh in um, to make sure resources that are received from federal stimulus packages get to the get to the communities who need them the most. Um, and those voices are are going to be desperately needed as the process continues. But they need to hear from us. Um, another question is: What are or what are being done to involve our faith-based communities to help work through uh, some of the the hate attacks and crimes? Are you aware of any collaboration with faith-based communities? I'm not as aware of faith-based communities, but going to another question that I saw, certainly leaders in the other communities of color have spoken out very forcefully uh, in defense of the Asian American community. So that is groups like the NAACP, National Urban League, Unidos US. Uh, a number of them have been excellent about that. And, and that is very heartening to see. One thing I would say that I would remind all of us in the Asian American community is that we do have a similar obligation when other communities are attacked. Because frankly, you know, it's great to see and the collaboration that we've seen from all these groups have been great. But again, I will admit that I, I sometimes feel a little bit mixed about it because the Asian American community has not always been great about standing up for the African American community, not always been great about standing up for the Latino community. So we also should use this as a moment to remind ourselves about what makes us all better together. Uh, to thank them for their efforts, uh, and then to remind ourselves that we can also do better uh, when when other communities are being attacked, because we know that that this that they happen and, and they will continue to be. Um, there's also a question here about um, uh, what if if one does experience hate crime or as an individual or or some kind of uh, racially motivated harassment i think we covered a little bit about this in, in the beginning of our conversation what is your recommendation um how 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 should one um i guess address this this uh, encounter that they had i think everyone has to be in their own comfort zone their own zone of physical safety first Right. If you are the victim of a hate crime or an incident now, and let me take a step back, you know, we should distinguish between crimes, violence, you know, verbal assault. There is a whole panoply. Right. Uh, always think about your physical safety first. You know, it, it, depending on the situation, you might want to say something. I don't preclude people from saying that. I think it is always wrong. To re we certainly always think it's wrong to resort to violence. That does not help the situation at all. Uh, if you are with people in a group that can help de-escalate the situation uh, so that it does not become some sort of physical confrontation, that is good. Calling them out though, if it is safe, again, I emphasize safe, if it is safe to do so, is appropriate. Uh, and sometimes, let's also not forget that sometimes people uh, sometimes they don't do it out of malice. I uh, know there's a lot of different situations, but if we can give them the benefit of the doubt and use it as an educational experience, I don't put it past us to do that as well. And then lastly, I would say, do report it. What's the point of reporting it? Because by reporting it, we could talk to policymakers. We could talk to influencers about how prevalent this is. As you guys all know in the Asian American community, uh, Asian Americans are oftentimes invisible. People do not see that we have the same issues as other communities of color. And so if we are able to document it, uh, 
to show that this is happening to the Asian American community as well. That is helpful to all of us to be able to tell our story and to make sure that we are part of that solution. Others, Greg or Madeline? Madeline, you wanna go ahead? I fully agree with what John is saying. And, and I know that this is um, such a stressful time for people in terms of trying to understand their role in society and how they are able to be an ally or say something. And again, it's all situational based on your own safety and, and how you can um, you know, take a stock of the situation. So again, it's really about aggregating these incidences so that we can be able to show you know, where it's happening on our regional basis, geographically and, you know, demographically, all of these things um, are important because this is how people are, are um, you know, sharing their experiences. And then we're able to then show, share that with um, people who are able to uh, formulate public policy. So I think this is important for us, um, even though it might be something that people don't necessarily want to talk about that it, um, again, being an engaged citizen um, and being able to document it is so important so that we have uh, that information to share. So one thing I'll add is, I, I agree with both John and Madeline about the need to report because it is incredibly difficult to make an argument to policymakers without data. And we already know that our community lacks data in all sorts of different policy um, areas. And so, Certainly, we want to be respectful of people's comfort level. Um, but I think, you know, one of the comments I saw in the chat, you know, really resonated with me. I think in this conversation, we have to remember that, uh, you know, the mental health aspect of this is really important. Um, you know, while it's easy for us to say, you know, you should report, and it's easy for other people to dismiss this as not being racist, um, it's easy to dismiss this kind of things when you're not directly impacted by it. And certainly, many of us, you know, in this chat, you know, have no people or I've heard stories and can certainly see ourselves as being impacted by this. But I think it's important to remember that the victims themselves, it's, it's difficult to know, really know what that sort of mental health impact can be. Um, even something as simple as harassment or intimidation, people can carry with them for the rest of their lives. And so, yes, it's important to report these things, but also, you know, a little bit of empathy can go a really long way these days. Do you have a message for our young people? I, I know there are a lot of our listeners are, are students that are calling in and, and um, we've seen reports about bullying on campuses and things like that. And I know a lot of the schools have, uh, have suspended school for the rest of the semester and so forth, but still young people are very vulnerable uh, to these kinds of um, harassments as well. Do you have any recommendations for young people? As a parent of two kids myself, those are probably the reports that are the most heartbreaking to me uh, of kids getting bullied. And oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes the teachers do offer a sense of support. So that might be the first line of defense. The school administrators, uh, school superintendents oftentimes can intervene with useful policies. So I think all of those are, are levels that, that, that we would go to. Because I think this is, and this goes back to an earlier point as well, it's about mental health. But then the other thing about all of this is, this is not simply about political correctness, right? Because sometimes when, when people go to quote unquote authorities, whether it's teachers or the like, they say, oh, it's just don't, you know, you just shrug it off. But this is not something that people should be asked to shrug off. This, these are things that have lasting impact. Certainly for me, and I would venture to say for our panelists, we still remember when we got called you know, for me, it was being called a chink, right? We still remember when, when we're in grade school, we were made fun of. It has a lasting effect. And so I think certainly reporting that is important. Uh, talking to your parents about it is important. Uh, and then that's why the tone at the top makes such a difference. Because where are these students getting it from? They're getting it from media. They're getting from the sources that they, that they, they are relying on. So if the parents of these students that are doing the bullying are, have a better framework or better educated, I don't want to be patronizing about it, but, but understand these issues in a different way, I, I, that is part of the answer. It's, it's not an easy answer. I mean, it's an all of society or all of answer, but all of these are different elements that we should think about 
and that we could all lean in on in a little bit of uh, in a little way. And I think it's not just our uh, our youth; it's also our elderly, and it's also you know a lot of them are vulnerable because sometimes their families may not live with them; they may live across the country or in a different state, and and so they are sometimes left on their own. and And so it's so important for us to combat this because of the fact that there are, are vulnerable citizens at all ages, and that we are not going to allow this type of language to be accepted as a normal piece of society. And that uh, being able to uh, combat it in a way that says, there is some level of grace attached to this at the same time standing up um, for ourselves and saying that this is uh, inappropriate, inflammatory and harmful to communities. And um, again, making sure that our communities within our own constituencies. You know, no one can tell the difference between a Chinese American versus another ethnic group within our constituency. They just see a bunch of Asians. And so that's something that as a community, we have to stand up and say, this is not helpful and this is harmful. Um, and so, and you know, to you know, John's point and my earlier point about building coalition, this is how we do that and seeing young people elderly who are of all different ethnic backgrounds together in a way shows that coalition is a part of you know why we are a community of not just our ethnic backgrounds but also as citizens um the one final question i think it's related to our conversation here is and i think all of us have been involved in some of these conversations in the past is uh um this anti-asian american sentiment in in the in the in the social media world and what is being done in the social media world because a lot of you know a lot of kind of the harsh language is, is being exchanged in facebook and you know twitter and other places what's being done on that front um just on a national scale that you're aware of mm -hmm. well, well certainly facebook has been relatively good about taking down harmful posts uh, taking about it, taking down posts that that really are to anti-Asian violence. We've actually a number of us have had discussions with them specifically about this point, and they're definitely conscious of it. Uh, so I, I, to a large extent, I would applaud them for that effort. And that's one of the unfortunate things also about this time is that as all of us are sheltering in, in place or are staying at home, frankly, I think it does give people more time on social media. I think that distance, as we all know, uh, causes people to be a little bit less careful or less empathetic, as Greg, Greg said, in how they characterize things. And so uh, that's just the reality that we're going to have to deal with. Others? I would agree with everything John said. I, you know, I think it's really useful to have balance these days. And obviously, we don't want to necessarily go out too much, but you know, I, I've tried to stay off social media as much as I can. I mean, it's tough given the work, but I it just, it's, it's a challenging space, right? Like it can be very, very positive and uplifting and we can have conversations like this, which are great, but there are people who are just, you know, they need direction, you know, to a, a direction to sort of point their anger and frustration um, or their fear. And so again, I think in some ways it's like John said, it shouldn't be on us to sort of shoulder this burden, but a little bit, a little bit of empathy just again goes a long way and remembering that people are angry, upset and, and afraid. And so it just, it's understandable. But like I said, I try to stay away from social media on a personal level as much as I can, but it, it is tough these days. Yeah, it is. it is. And you have to give credit to those influencers who are standing up. Um, you know, Cardi B actually did a little uh, video chat basically talking about it. Um, and it is, Again, one of those things where people outside of our community who who remind uh, others that this is wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, we're coming to the top of the hour. Uh, this our time together went by so quickly. Um, I just wanted to uh, give each of our speakers a final word of uh, encouragement or a call to action to our community uh, before we sign off for today. Um, why don't we start with, uh, with you, Greg, and um, any final words to our community before we sign off? Sure, just thank everyone for joining us and hopefully you found it 
a useful conversation. I, I, I've seen in the chat window, there's a number of questions about where people can find re additional resources. And we'll make sure that we share with Abe and his team and CKA all the resources that the Encapa member organizations have put together. Um, it ranges from, again, sort of health providers to API workers to the elderly. So we'll make sure we share that. So thank you again. Thank you. Natalie? And thank you uh, to Abe and CK for this opportunity and for the uh, participants who logged on to watch. Um, you know, Apex, we are here to encourage that representation. And so in this, again, engage citizens um, to be able to um, participate, um, be seen, um, be in coalition with uh, our other communities um, so that we can support each other as you know, we go in these uncertain times. Great, thank you. John? Thank you, and thank you to Abe and CKA for putting this on. As I was looking at the chat box, you could see my eyes going back and forth a few times. There are some great resources that people are offering even on the chat boxes about local organizing movements, whether it's in Texas, whether it's in New York. So that in itself gives me hope. It gives me hope about how all of us in an individual or small group capacity or large group capacity can do something about this. So uh, I thank all of you for participating because frankly, it gives me greater energy. Uh, as all of us, Greg, Dave, Madeline know, you know, especially here in DC, oftentimes we get jaded, oftentimes we get overwhelmed by all the things that are happening, certainly in this time. And I feel more energized, more energized to fight for all of you, more energized to move forward, and, and more energized to organize at all these different levels. So thank you all. Keep those ideas coming. Get in touch with us if you have other ideas or how all of us can help. Uh, and together, we could really move forward and, and make a difference in this very, very unprecedented, unprecedented time. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, John, Madeline, and Greg for your time today. I know it's a super busy time for all of you, but I thought this was an important opportunity for us as leaders to come together to share about this important uh, topic and, and how to combat this uh, disturbing trend in our country. Uh, I think we could have talked for a couple of hours. <laughs> There's so many things we could have covered, uh, but I hope uh, that we can actually continue this conversation and, and do this in the future and we will uh, re-engage with all of our communities uh, about doing perhaps a follow-up conversation. Many of you have asked about recordings. Uh, and so a, a couple of two quick announcements for you. One is that we will be um, uh, taking this recording of this, uh, of this discussion of the last hour, packaging it up, and then we'll be sending it out to all of our participants here. So you will have this available to you. Uh, so we will make sure to do that within the next day or so. Um, and secondly, um, um, uh, we also are going to be, CK is going to continue to do more webinars. In fact, we have one on this Thursday about COVID-19 and the impact on our global economy. Uh, on Thursday um, at uh, 4.45 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we'll be sending out more information about that. But if you want to sign up for that, you can come to our website at uh, www.councilka.org, and you can sign up for that. Uh, but with that, uh, please help me thank uh, our wonderful uh, speakers today. Thank you again. And you can, I know we can't hear you applaud, but you can say, you can type thank you or bravo in the chat room and, uh, and they will see all of, all, of your, all of your thank yous. So thank you to all of you and we hope to see you in our next webinar. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.